Morning, folks. Morning. Welcome to worship this morning. It's good to be back with you again. Uh, we had a, a lovely break at the end of August, Pam and I, and uh, uh, but it's good to be back. Um, and thank you, I should say, to everybody who came to my uh, welcome service yesterday uh, in Bentham. On th- that was Thursday evening in Bentham. Uh, it was really good to see so many people there from across our circuit. Uh, thank you if you were one of those who managed to come uh, and to wish me well in this new role uh, of superintendency. Um, it feels a bit strange, to be honest. Uh, it's always been coming, uh, and now this is my first Sunday as um, a superintendent minister in the circuit, and uh, looking forward to uh, spending time in different churches. Um, thank you to everybody for well wishes. Uh, it's been really lovely. Um, I'm afraid. Uh, bear with us a little while um, as we recruit the roles that we're looking to recruit. Uh, and bring on the help and support because at the minute I'm trying to do everything Um, but shortly I'm hoping that will change uh, and we'll have some support in different places uh, around the circuit. Uh, That aside it's lovely to be with you again. Uh, Today we're going to continue our occasional series on Romans Uh, so we're in Romans chapter 5 today looking at Paul's great uh, theological essay um, what it means to, to have faith and, and grace and uh, to find redemption and, and today particularly uh, to be at peace with God what it means to have peace with God uh, and an assurance of our salvation uh, as we come before God together let's pray uh, Lord we thank you for this time we thank you that we can gather together in your name here uh, around our circuit and beyond We pray that for those of us who gather, you might join us together in fellowship one with another, that our praise might lift to you, our prayers might stir you. Lord, move our hearts, we pray, as you renew us and remake us in the image of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, We're going to begin our service today uh, with the lovely blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Let's sing together. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. of God, thorn of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Saviour all day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Saviour all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Saviour all day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Saviour all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Saviour all day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Saviour all the day long. Amen. 
Uh, it's a lovely hymn that, isn't it? It always stirs my heart. It always makes me think that, you know, we need to tell our stories more. Uh, the, the assurance of God uh, in our hearts is something that, that really does touch um, those around us, that those we know, those who hear it. Uh, our confidence, our hope, our, our faith in Christ uh, really should move those people that we know. Uh, we're going to hear today in our reading in Romans, Paul's uh, assurance of faith, uh, how it is that he is sure uh, of his salvation and redemption through Christ, through the peace that he has with God. Uh, as we gather then, let's pray. Uh, Lord, we thank you for this song, for this blessed assurance of faith and hope that we have in you. Uh, we pray as we lift our hearts to you now that you would renew us, move in us by your spirit. Lord, we confess to you things past, times when we haven't always followed what you would have us do. We haven't honoured your name, lived up to our calling, shared our faith. Give us a boldness. Give us a vision of your kingdom made, made here in this place. <laughs> Lord, make us in your image, we pray, as a community of your people. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, one or two notices. Uh, it's the... Um, I say it was a lovely service um, on Thursday evening, uh, which was my welcome service. That there are one or two uh, things coming up that I wanted to mention to you. Um, the first is uh, at Settle um, on the, the second Wednesday of the month. This is Bible Book Club. Um, so that for this month will be on the 13th of uh, September. Wednesday the 13th and we're continuing the book of Samuel uh, actually we only did the first eight chapters or so of Samuel uh, in our last Bible book club so uh, we so that's 12 o'clock at St John's at Settle uh, on Wednesday the 13th um, our Bible book club um, on Sunday the 17th Sunday the 17th um, it's uh, at St John's and Settle again there's the Think Local event uh, so uh, last year we had a very successful event called uh, Talking Rubbish. Um, this Think Local is, is organised by our eco group. Uh, the idea is that we think a little bit about um, the, where the food comes from that we buy, where, where the goods that we um, live day to day by, how far they've travelled uh, and what we're impacting and who we're impacting uh, by our purchase of them. Um, that there's a, an eco principle called LOAF, which is uh, local, organic, uh, animal friendly, fair trade. Um, and, and it would be really nice if we could, um, you know, think about that as we uh, go through our day to day lives. So um, it's at two o'clock on Sunday the 17th and there'll be all sorts of speakers uh, and stalls and, and different sorts of things going on there. Um, and then uh, on fr Wednesday the 20th of September, at Limestone View, uh, there'll be a, a Harvest Festival Songs of Praise. So our Harvest Songs of Praise, Wednesday the 20th, uh, three o'clock at Limestone View in the atrium there. Um, we try to do quarterly a, a Songs of Praise at Limestone um, and it's open to anybody to come, uh, but it's a, a lovely um, time of, of praise with the, the residents there um, and, and a great time of witness and worship. So if you're able to make that, everybody's welcome. It's um, Wednesday the 20th of September at three o'clock and we'll be singing uh, a good number of well-known uh, harvest hymns. Uh, obviously uh, in our churches at the moment there are harvest festivals going on throughout September um, and, and I do encourage you to, to look out for uh, when those might be uh, and to get along to them if you can do just to celebrate the, the goodness of God. Um, the 1st of September marks the beginning of a, a thing called the season of creation. And traditionally in our churches, we uh, remember the, the goodness of God, the diversity of creation, uh, and that God looked upon creation and said, you know, this is good. <laughs> this is good. Uh, and so we celebrate um, the diversity of life and we lament over the state of our planet uh, and call on God for his help in its renewal and ultimately its redemption. We're going to sing once more. We're going to sing a, a lovely song. Uh, Come thou fount of every blessing. 
tune my heart to sing your grace. Let's worship together. I really love that hymn. The, the, the words of that, that final verse, I just think uh, they speak of everything that we're going to go through today in Romans. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. But let that grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. But take my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it from thy courts above. Lord, bind me to yourself. Bind me to you in the name of Jesus. Uh, we're going to pray now for our church and for our world. Let's pray. Uh, loving God, we thank you for those words. Take our hearts, we pray. Seal them by the grace of heaven. Uh, Lord, we pray now for our circuit, for our churches, for our family, friends and community, and for our world. We pray for those who are sick, in body, mind or spirit, for those who suffer. Uh, Lord, meet them by your healing power, we pray. Stir them by your spirits, renew them and remake them in the fullness of life and health. We pray for those who mourn, for all who've lost loved ones. Lord, comfort them, we pray. Move in them by your comforting spirit and presence. Give them an assurance of hope and future glory. We pray for family, friends and community. We pray for those who are struggling at this difficult time. Those worried about money and bills. Those struggling in relationships. Lord, meet us in this time, we pray. Speak to us of hope of a future place. Re strengthen our resolve and renew our faith that our hope may grow stronger by the trials that we go through. We pray for our nation. We pray for our world. 
We pray for our schools as children prepare to return. Bless the pupils, bless the teachers, bless their learning, we pray. May they know something of future hope, Lord. And we pray too then for our world. We pray for places of conflict around our world. We pray, of course, for Ukraine in the Middle East and North Africa. We pray for faraway places. Lord, we pray for peace. And we remember the brokenness of our planet. For the hurricanes that swept through Florida. For those made homeless. For those devastated by loss, we pray. For those whose livelihoods and homes are threatened by wildfires. By those whose homes are threatened by rising seas. For all whose harvests have failed, whose waters have run dry. Lord, we pray. Send your Spirit on the chaos, the darkness of this world. Renew the face of it. In the name and through the power of Jesus Christ, your word made flesh. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Uh, we're going to sing again uh, before we hear our scriptures for today. Um, this is the lovely, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind, forgive our foolish ways. Let's worship.
So our reading today uh, comes from Romans chapter 5. Uh, so this is the, the seventh week that we've been doing Romans uh, in this uh, little series. Um, and we, we're up to chapter five. Uh, we're going to try and cover the whole of chapter five today, uh, which might seem like a bit of a struggle, but hopefully we'll get through it. Um, so we're going to read, first of all, this is uh, Romans chapter five, uh, beginning at the first verse. Um, and the title of this is uh, Peace and Hope. Uh, Therefore... Since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Uh, Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope doesn't put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we've now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've now received reconciliation. Just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account when there's no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses even over those who didn't sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin, The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. Just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Goodness me, this is powerful stuff from Paul. We'll get into it in a moment or two. We'll we'll try our best to unpack it as we go through. Uh, we're going to sing once more. And, and this is a song that I think uh, says everything about what we've just heard. Uh, this is Cornerstone. Uh, Jesus paid it all. Let's sing together. Jesus 
business I dare not trust the sweetest frame But wholly trust in Jesus' name seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within. His oath, His covenant, His blood Support me in the whelming flood When all around my soul gives way shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless stand before the Wonderful. Uh, amen. Um, let's just pray, shall we, as we think about this scripture we've heard. Let's pray. Uh, loving God, we thank you for your words written here through Paul. Uh, we pray, Lord, as we hear it and as we think of it, you might stir our hearts, speak to us of the assurance of faith and of peace made with you through Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. Amen. So we're back in Romans. We're in Romans chapter five. Um, we've been going through this study series on Romans and you'll remember, uh, hopefully, that, that Romans is split into a number of sections um, and sections, chapters one to eight, uh, really give um, Paul, this is Paul outlining his understanding of the, the meaning of the life and death and resurrection of Christ uh, and of our participation in it through baptism. We, we come to baptism next week in, in a big way uh, and we're going to talk about that. Um, Paul goes on in the later chapters to talk about how that affects us, how it, it changes the way that we live uh, and how we adapt to that. Um, but we're very much in the heart of uh, Paul explaining his theology, uh, his understanding of what um, the, the life and death of Jesus uh, actually means. 
Uh, in the last week or so, um, the, the last time that we studied this, we talked about um, faith. So uh, Romans 4 is a, a big chapter on faith. It speaks particularly of, of Abraham. Um, and, it, and it says this, against all hope, uh, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Uh, just as it, it was said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was a hundred years old. Yet he didn't waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith. This is uh, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. Romans 4 verse 21. Being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. This is why. Paul says it was credited to him as righteousness and so we talked about faith and righteousness we talked about the the difference between having uh, been just a a simply one who believes and one who has faith Uh, belief in God is a very different thing to having faith in God as Christians we don't simply believe in God uh, or in Jesus or, or even in his life and death and resurrection because of those things we have faith in God's promises the things that he's um, promised the things that he said that he has declared us righteous in Christ that one day we will be restored to his presence and live in all of its glory being fully persuaded of his power and his willingness to do what he's promised so believing in God and having faith in God and the promises of God are, are two very different things uh, faith is, is an active thing that, that changes uh, who we are and our outlook, our perception uh, of life itself. And so we, we come to Romans 5, having heard all of that in Romans 4, understanding uh, the nature and the importance of faith and what it is that we have faith in. And it's important that we do, because Paul begins chapter 5 with the word, therefore, Therefore, um, therefore, because we have faith, what comes next is important. But what comes next is nothing unless we've put our faith, put our trust, put our hope in Jesus to, to do what he said that he was going to do. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, and then we come on to verse one, we have a peace with God. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have a peace with God. The foundation of our peace is faith. We fully trust that God will do what he said, that he will declare us righteous, that he has um, cleared our account, uh, wiped the slate clean, that we're justified and we're justified by faith alone. We are declared innocent. We said that last time and that will never change. We said that Uh, Abraham wasn't simply declared innocent uh, by Genesis 15 and everything that he did there on after uh, was in jeopardy. No, uh, Abraham was declared innocent. He was declared righteous by God because he believed and had faith in God's promises. And he lived out that faith for the rest of his life. So how do we know? How can we be assured of faith? Well, Paul says, therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have a peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have a peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It bears repeating. But what does it mean then? The fundamental question that comes through this is, what does it mean to have peace with God? I'm going to read from Ephesians. This is Ephesians 2, uh, verses 14 to 17. Uh, And they're headed, Christ is our peace. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Paul's talking about Jews and Gentiles. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. That he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross, therefore putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to you who were near. 
in other words, Christ himself is our peace because in his dying on the cross, he put to death the cause of our enmity with God, the cause of separation, the, the cause of um, why it was that we were separated and, uh, and opposed to God. What made God our adversary? Paul says, were the commandments of the law, that the commandments convicted us of sin, that they stood as silent witness to our failure. They reminded us that, that God must act justly, that the kingdom of heaven is good, that the commandments guide us towards what is good, and they condemn us as unrighteous because we don't live by and abide by and live up to those commandments. So, if the commandments define what is good, then they stand against us. They stand as silent witness, convicting us uh, of the way that we live our lives. Christ then came to be our peace. When Jesus died, Paul says, he took the penalty of the law, the consequences, the, the conviction of that sin. And in its place, we did this two weeks ago, uh, God credited us with his righteousness. God gave us, God imputed to us, God uh, replaced our sinfulness with his righteousness. The consequences of that are foundational and fundamental. There is no longer any reason for God to be our adversary, no longer any reason for us to be opposed to God. We've been made righteous, good enough for the kingdom of heaven. We are at peace with God. We have no enmity. There is no source of conviction, no source that can separate us from the love and the life of God. God has credited us through faith with his righteousness. So there's no longer any reason at all for God to be our adversary. And so we have peace. Our sin separated us from God. We were in jeopardy of his judgment. When that condemnation is removed, there is no longer jeopardy. There is simply peace. There is love's commendation, triumphing, uh, defeating sin's condemnation. I'll say that again. Love's commendation triumphs over sin's condemnation. Sin no longer condemns because Jesus' love commends us to God with his righteousness. We've been given the righteousness of God. We have no adversary in God. We don't stand against God. We have a peace our relationship with God, in other words, is fully redeemed, fully reconciled, fully restored in every way that it's possible for that relationship to be restored. It is restored. And as we said last time, how do we receive that gift? We receive that gift by faith. We put our faith in the promise of God that he has redeemed us. He has declared us righteous. He has restored us. Now the question remains. Do we really believe that in our heart of hearts? Do we believe that we have a complete and total peace with God? Or do we still feel that we need to earn God's favour by our own efforts, uh, earn his um, commendation, uh, earn some degree of goodness? Are there, is there still something that we think we can do to find our place in the kingdom of heaven. John Wesley, I'm going to go back to our Methodist roots, had been brought up piously by his devout parents. He followed them into Christianity. He was ordained as a priest. He'd been studying at Oxford. Uh, he became a priest in the Church of England. Uh, in 1725, while he was at Oxford, he made a solemn vow to devote himself wholly to God in his outward conduct, in his inward temper. He vowed to, to change his character, to become more and more Christ-like. Wesley strived all his life for what he called a, a, a holiness uh, in Christ. Wesley's journal Famously, March the 24th, uh, May the 24th, 1738. 
It shows how he had to reassess the whole previous 35 years of his life when he encountered these passages in Romans. His familiar words are often cited. This is from his journal, May the 24th, 1738. I went very unwillingly to a society meeting in Aldersgate Street, where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, when he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for my salvation, and an assurance was given me that he'd taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he'd taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Romans 5 is that fundamental. We have a peace with God because we are no longer subject to the law of sin and death. We've been given a new nature. Uh, Wesley's heart was made new in that moment. He acknowledged, uh, and I love these words, he said before 1738 he had the faith of a servant. Afterwards, he had the faith of a son. He went from having the faith of a servant to the faith of a son. He knew a deepened experience of forgiveness, an assurance of faith, a, a new personal freedom. These gifts not only changed his inner life, but they transformed his ministry. Uh, Wesley no longer worked to earn God's favour, no longer um, felt that he had to do things for, for personal holiness, though of course he sought those things as well. But he did them because he knew he had freedom in Christ. From the faith of a servant to the faith of a son. I wonder, if we reflect on that just for a moment, how does your faith feel? Like a son, like a daughter, or like a servant? Do you feel that you're still desperately trying to please your master, who ultimately will judge you? Or do you feel that you've been freed from the law of sin and death? That you've been given a, a freedom in Christ by your faith? A declaration of righteousness to live freely and fully? Have you felt God's assurance in your own life? What does heartwarming mean to you? I've shared uh, many times before, and I'll share again, uh, my own experience of coming to faith felt very similar to John Wesley. I'd never heard of John Wesley at the time I came to faith in an Anglican church. But I remember very well walking home from youth group one night in my mid-teens, asking Jesus into my heart and feeling a deep, deep sense of his presence. A sense of his presence that when years later I read John Wesley saying that his heart felt strangely warmed, I thought, yeah, that was me too. I felt and knew the, the presence of God. I felt God's life well up within me. I felt a, an assurance. I wonder if you have that same sense of assurance. I wonder if you feel, therefore, a peace with God. Or if you're still striving to achieve that peace by your own efforts. Paul wants you to know that your righteousness, your Peace doesn't depend on how you feel. For while we were still helpless, Romans 5 verse 6, when the moment was right, Christ died for the ungodly. First, first came the actions of God, the action that made peace possible. Then by grace, an invitation for us to put our faith in the work of God, 
to believe the promise of God that he would declare us righteous, that he has declared us righteous by faith, by the same faith through which Abraham was declared righteous. For this is God's plan. This is God's work. This is God's invitation to all people. While we were still helpless, when the moment was right, Christ died for the ungodly. And now he invites us to accept that, to live that by faith, to know that we don't earn God's favour by our effort, but that we've been declared righteous by Christ. Now accept that gift. That night uh, in 1738 changed John Wesley's understanding of faith. It fueled his preaching. He longed for all people to know that same assurance of faith, to have that same sense of God. Uh, he came to believe in and to preach what has become known in Methodism, though whether Wesley ever used these terms, we're not sure, but became known as the four alls. That all need to be saved. That all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That all may be saved. For while we were still helpless, when the moment was right, Christ died for the ungodly. That all may know they're saved, that they may know they're saved because they have peace with God. No longer are we striving to please a, a difficult master. We've been reconciled, we have peace, we've been declared righteous. Now, finally, uh, these four rules, Wesley believed that all could be saved to the uttermost. What does it mean to be saved to the uttermost? It means to achieve the likeness of Christ, uh, to be wholly aligned to the will of God and to the purposes of God in our lives, that God can save the very depths of us and the very heights of us, that all of us, whole, the whole of us, can be transformed by the righteousness of Christ. All of us is declared righteous, not part of us, not a hidden away um, bit that we don't want God to see. All of us is declared righteous in the presence of God. All need to be saved, all may be saved, all may know they're saved, our heartwarming moment, and all may then be saved to the very uttermost. All of us, the whole life of us. So now, everything in our life will be okay. Well, Paul has something to say about that too. Uh, for much of the Old Testament, uh, people's prosperity is an outward sign, a metaphor of their relationship with God. Uh, you think about the, the, the places of the Old Testament condemned, at Edom, Assyria, Sodom, Babylon. You think of the Israelites in the wilderness and their uh, up and, and down um, sense of, of God's presence among them. Uh, they're turning and, and making a, a golden calf and um, their lack of trust in God and then they're turning to God. They're constant turning away and turning back. And, and in the moments when they turn away, things don't go well for them. A, a, a brief summary of that, you, the first seven, eight chapters of 1 Samuel, the, the people are constantly facing the, the battle of the Philistines. They, they've turned away from God. They, um, the Ark of the Covenant, the, the symbol of God's presence among them, has become nothing more than a, a talisman, a, a symbol uh, of God's presence that didn't mean anything because the people's hearts were far from God. Uh, they would defeat they were losing in battle to the, the Philistines and so they went and got the Ark of the Covenant like it was some good luck charm and took it into battle and of course that the Philistines captured it and then a, a few chapters later uh, the people turned back to God under Samuel uh, there's a collective return a, a collective weeping and wailing a, a confession uh, of their past sin uh, and as they return to God, they, they gather in one place and the, the Philistine armies look upon them and think, well, they're all in one place now. Let's have another go at them. Uh, this could be our chance to finally wipe them out. And the people turn to Samuel and say to Samuel, plead on our behalf, will you? Uh, and Samuel turns to God and uh, pleads with God and, and points to the, the new uh, renewed hearts of God's people. And one of my favourite verses in the, in the Bible comes uh, just as Samuel was praying. It, we're told the Lord thundered. The Lord thundered. I can imagine what it's like when the Lord thunders. It says the Lord thunders that the armies of the Philistines were, were routed um, and the battle won. 
we know that it didn't last. So you read the prophecies of Isaiah and Ezekiel of the people who've turned away from God and returned and turned away and things have gone well and things haven't. Uh, and as things don't go well, the neighbouring armies, the, the neighbouring peoples overrun them and the people, are, the people of God are, are forced into exile. In that context, it would be dead easy uh, to look at Paul's life and the life of the early Christians and to think that they were suffering because God wasn't with them, because God had abandoned them or because they turned away from God. Paul isn't saying then all will be well in this world. He's saying that our peace isn't dependent upon them. Because our peace has been made with God. Our peace with other people in this world is a different thing. But our peace has been made with God. And that peace with God is all that matters. Because that's where our hope lies. That's where our future lies. That's where everything we hope for, everything we've invested our time, our, our effort, our lives in, that's where that lies. And he says that because our peace is not dependent on this world. Our peace is Christ. I'm not alone, John 16, 32, uh, verse 32. I, I'm not alone for my father is with me. Jesus is about to leave them. But he tells them that he's not alone. He has an assurance. He's reconciled with his father. I've told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you may have trouble. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. Jesus is saying that the trouble will follow his people. But that their peace isn't dependent on it. Because he's not talking about a... A, a nice peace, a, a nice uh, relationship with everybody in this world. He's talking about something far more important, something far more fundamental. He's talking about peace with God. So Paul boasts of a peace, peace that persists, even in the midst of struggle. As the world gets worse, we have a hope in glory to come. We put our faith in a world without sin, a, a world free from judgment, a world free from curse. Our tribulations in this world just make us hope harder for that world to come. It strengthens our resolve to work for the kingdom of God breaking in to the trouble and the difficulty and the struggle of this life. It causes us to look even more hungrily at all that is to be. In spite of all that's happening in this world, Paul knows he's at peace with God. And he urges us to know that same peace through Jesus Christ. Because if we know that we're at peace with God, then our hope is all bound up in that. Paul goes on to talk of Adam. It's worth just dwelling and reflecting on that. I'm not going to go through that in a lot of detail today because we're pretty much out of time. But Adam's disobedience to God resulted in death. We know that, but perhaps it resulted in death, not physically, certainly not immediately for Adam. But it certainly resulted in a spiritual death, in this enmity, in this sinful nature, this dying body. This turning away from God meant that there was no peace with God through Adam. Paul goes on to say, in Adam we inherit that sinful nature, that dying body. But in Christ we're born again uh, through the birth of our physical human birth, we inherit the nature of Adam. But in a new birth, in a spiritual birth, through Christ, we're reformed in the likeness of our new Adam, in the likeness of Christ. We receive Christ's nature in that moment, in place of Adam's. Paul says, so if one man's nature could be spread to all his descendants by physical birth, then Christ's perfect nature can be spread to all his descendants by spiritual birth rebirth. The Holy Spirit birthed Christ in Mary's womb and likewise births us uh, spiritually when we put our faith in Christ and believe. John 3 verse 3, you know this verse well. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. Romans five nineteen. for just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, 
the many will be made righteous. It's our new birth, our spiritual birth, that gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit, the new nature, the peace with Christ. We're assured of our faith by the peace that we have with God. So may we, who've been reborn by the Spirit, have the faith of the son and daughter, not the faith of the servant. For Christ is our righteousness. May we live with that freedom. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Uh, loving God, we thank you. We thank you for these words of Paul to help put some understanding of what it means to have peace with you and the source of our peace on this earth. We confess to you that here we have trouble. We sometimes lose our peace, our sense of peace. May we know that we never lose our peace with you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are going to sing again. We're going to sing the lovely, uh, wonderful, and can it be that I should gain an interest in my Saviour's blood. Let's sing.
Amen. Uh, thank you for joining me for our service this morning. It's been lovely to spend this time together. Uh, I look forward to seeing you soon. Uh, and now, in the words of Paul, to him who is able to do far more abundantly uh, than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. And the blessing of God. Father, Son and Holy Spirit, rest upon us and remain with us, now and always. Amen. Let's go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Uh, amen. Do have a lovely week. I look forward to seeing you soon. God bless. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and breathes for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is Save.